scholar of a whole body of research on societies which are recovering from conflict, focusing on rebuilding political institutions. Uh, she has done field work around the world in countries including Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, and uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, her work is even more pertinent than it usually is in the wake of this week's news that a peace treaty in Afghanistan is finally upon us, and certainly exactly the kinds of topics that she is going to be discussing will be directly pertinent to uh, the next steps in what lies ahead for Afghanistan, and certainly their ability to accomplish those goals are going to, in the most direct way, impinge on the American national security interest. So uh, she's going to give a talk today entitled uh, Untouchable Forces Restoring Trust and Security in Weak States. Question mark. Uh, she's going to talk for about 30 minutes and uh, then we're going to open up for Q&A. Just so you know, as part, as all, as is the case for all the events in the speaker series, uh, we're video recording the event, uh, and it'll be posted on our YouTube channel, so folks who can't, uh, aren't able to make it today can still uh, view the event. So, without any further ado, uh, I will, please. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here today. I um, am going to talk about a specific project that we've been working on in Guatemala, which applies to post-conflict context. I'm also happy to talk a little bit more in the Q&A about post-conflict elections, which is what I work on um, in many cases, um, which is most relevant for the U.S.-Taliban uh, uh, peace agreement. Today, the work that I'm going to present is joint work, joint research, together with a graduate student at Berkeley, Natalia garberas Diaz. And what I want to start off with is a, a little bit of a background on Guatemala. So this um, photo was taken during a scandal that erupted in 2015 in Guatemala. Um, in April, there was an investigation there that revealed that at least 40 high-ranking Guatemalan government officials were involved in a, a network of corruption that mainly extended into the customs house. So they were taking bribes. Um, and otherwise trafficking illicit goods um, for profit uh, in this particular case. And when it came to light in April 2015, the vice president resigned, and then ultimately um, the president of Guatemala, this is then President Otto Perez Molina, resigned uh, before the elections actually happened in that year. What's really interesting about this case is that Guatemala, in the aftermath of their civil war, which ended in 1996, has been very much um, uh, prone to corruption and crime, and these two phenomena tend to go hand in hand. So there's actually a UN official who said that Guatemala was a good place to commit a murder because you were almost certainly going to get away with it. Uh, prosecutions, even for murders, were in the single digits. So only you know, less than 10% of all murders were ever prosecuted um, in the case. This case, in particular, which is called La Linea, which involved the president, scandal that I mentioned, it actually took foreign investigators and foreign prosecutors coming in from the United Nations who worked for the United Nations to actually investigate and co-prosecute this case in Guatemala. So this um, mission uh, to Guatemala that was run by the United Nations is a post-post-conflict mission. It wasn't sort of the peacekeeping mission that happened right after it. It was the next um, phase of a mission there. And it's called CISIG, you'll hear that acronym a lot um, for its Spanish name, but the English name is the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala. So CISIG, as I'll tell you a little bit about, has been very effective in some of these cases, including La Linea, but what we wanted to know in this paper, what we wanted to study, is whether or not CISIG had a broader effect on um, re-securing the Guatemalan state and particularly their security institutions. So what we're going to do in this paper, and this is just a very brief outline, we'll go through each of the pieces, is examine a set of effects that we think could be happening in these cases that have to do with improving citizen perceptions of security in the state and security institutions broadly. So we want to see whether bringing in a foreign mission like CISIG might actually have these positive effects. What we argue in the paper is that these state building missions are likely to be viewed as effective themselves, but that they are also likely to have very little transfer effect to the state 
despite sort of the hopes and aims of policymakers. Hence the question mark uh, in the title. So what we did uh, to test this is we ran a survey experiment in 2015 in Guatemala, right after the president resigned, but in the lead up to the elections there. And we invoked a cooperative state building mission in those experiments in a way that I'll show you. And what we found is that it does have significant impact. It increases citizens' beliefs in effective security provision, but it does not change most of their other beliefs. The one troubling finding that we actually found, however, was that when successful, the foreign state builder does actually reduce the number of people who think that local institutions should be the entity that deals with crime broadly, which we see as somewhat an indicator of legitimacy. So we'll get to all of these results, but this is just to give you an overview of where we're going. All right, so let's start off with a theory of state building and why citizen perceptions matter so much um, in these post-conflict contexts in particular, but also in policing in general. This is the way that I like to think about different state building missions. Um, on the one hand, on the um, left-hand side of the screen, from your perspective, we can think about state building missions as neo-trusteeships or most forced interventions, where an outside actor, actor actually comes in and takes over the state, right? They are doing all of the functions of the state and they get to make all of the decisions about the state unilaterally. On the right-hand side of the screen from your perspective is the aid and advice that many other states get. So if they're not gonna have this foreign actor in, sometimes all they'll do is they'll take aid and they'll take advice about what to do with that aid or what to do with their own security institutions but they're not actually allowing foreign actors to carry out executive functions within their states. So on one hand, we have complete foreign control. On the other hand, we have complete domestic control of the state building process. What I think are interesting, and I'm writing a book about these uh, cases in the middle, so hopefully they're interesting to some of you as well, are cases in which host states actually invite foreign actors in to carry out some functions of the state, and here we're thinking especially about the security institutions, and to actually reform some of the state institutions. So I wanna examine sort of a subset of these institutions in this paper, and we'll be looking at the Guatemalan case because this is a nice canonical case of sort of these invited interventions. So we wanna think about here our cooperative state building missions, these delegation agreements, which we found to be designed to strengthen security and states broadly. But what these are, um, from a definitional perspective, are invited interventions that allow foreign troops, police, investigators, prosecutors, or judges, temporary authority to implement laws or policies in host states and to reform those host states institutions. This is the definition from my book project. We see lots of other people using sort of these definitions of security that encompasses both the police and the judicial sector. Um, so the authority to use or order the use of force is kind of the, the sphere in which we're interested in. These delegation agreements are underexplored, but they seem to be actually pretty common. So the Guatemala case that we'll talk about um, gives us one example in Central America, but there was also an effort to do another mission like this in Honduras after the Guatemalan mission in 2015, MOXI uh, for its acronym in Spanish, it ended up scaling that back so that it actually ends up looking more like the aid and advice box than the centralized invited intervention, but this was an effort to do something similar. There was a similar post-conflict effort in El Salvador, and recently there have been proposals in Colombia to do something like um, CISIG as well. Okay, so you might think like, okay, maybe we're seeing this a little bit in Latin America, Central America, but um, I also have cross-national data that I'm collecting and we're still cleaning up the data, but a first cut shows that about 40% of all Sub-Saharan African cases have multiple delegation agreements between 1980 and 2015. So it seems to be a pretty widespread phenomenon, so we wanna be able to understand it better. So the aspect that we're gonna focus in on today is thinking about the relationship between the state and its citizens and how this foreign actor fits into that. So what we think here is that sustained safe state security provision relies on citizen cooperation in the longer term. So here, um, we can think about this from the state building literature perspective. David Lake is a famous scholar in this, right, who, who suggests that states require the reconstruction of both the state's monopoly of violence and the legitimacy of that monopoly, right? 
So it's not just about regaining control over force, but actually regaining legitimacy in that position of control. There then is an argument that this legitimacy can, in some cases, create this virtual cycle, whereby if you provide good security, more citizens will cooperate with you, and then you'll be able to provide better security based on that information, and then they'll cooperate more with you, right? So this is Margaret Levy's work, and this is also in the state building arena, suggesting that citizens can play sort of a very important role here if they um, get into a trusting and cooperative relationship. We don't just come at this perspective from a state building um, angle in the paper, though we also come at this from a policing perspective. When we're thinking about day-to-day -day interactions with police on the ground, the literature there, especially coming out of sociology, uh, individuals like Tom Tyler, suggests that police rely on citizen cooperation to sort of identify problems and address them, right? So if we think about patrolling, um, for instance, this can be a really difficult job for police, and so the more information they're able to gain from the community, the better off they are. This is sometimes referred to as community policing, but it, it extends both on the ground and then all the way up into the court systems where getting the trust of witnesses, for example, can be really important to making or breaking a case against an individual. So we think citizens have a really crucial role to play um, in these processes, but what we want to know are whether foreign actors might have a role in changing the way that they think about these, uh, changing the way citizens think about state institutions. This is pretty rarely studied, but there are a couple of papers that we can draw on here. So first, um, there's a paper in Liberia that examines this in terms of peacekeeping, UN peacekeeping in Liberia, and it shows that when you do have this sort of cooperative relationship between the UN peacekeepers and the police in Liberia, that you can get a more positive uh, outcome in terms of individuals using state institutions instead of using customary institutions. But that paper actually finds negative effects on people's attitudes towards the state. So they're using the state institutions more, but they actually are, trust the state less and otherwise believe in the state less uh, in those instances. So it's kind of a, a, an interesting and a bit confusing result. Most of the other work does not directly examine this issue. So there are a bunch of studies in Afghanistan, for example, that look at citizen uh, treatment and then their cooperation with foreign forces, their attitudes towards foreign forces, but not focused on the state forces as much. And then there is some work about NGOs and foreign aid that suggests that um, there may be sort of different relationships here between like cooperation um, in if you if you are running a foreign funded project versus a state funded project. But that's not usually in the security sector. Okay, so we want to be able to answer this question. So what we argue uh, in this is that state builders tend to provide an influx of course of capacity that can strengthen the provision of security by doing a few different things. One, augmenting expertise. So for example, in the, in the Guatemala case, um, uh, the courts did not use, uh, the police did not use wiretapping until we actually see SISIG enter, and so they're training their counterparts on how to use wiretapping, how to set it up from a procedural perspective, as well as from a legal perspective where new laws are passed on this. They also, in most cases, deploy coordinated teams who can work together uh, on these outcomes. And then finally, they provide resources in many of these cases. So they come in fully resourced to pay for the team, but also usually to do some capacity building on the local state as well. The other dimension of this is that these missions are foreign, and so they, they're you know, often established by IGOs, intergovernmental organizations, and so they don't respond to the same incentives and opportunities as those in the state do. And in cases where we do have these corruption and crime networks, this can be really helpful because we're able to sort of remove these individuals from these corruption networks. And so even if the individual is fundamentally good, they're not having their family threatened or having people pull in favors to get them to change a policy, right? They're sort of outside of this network. So we think that these factors together in, mean that in many cases, state builders can start virtuous cycles. We expect that the outsiders will be um, perceived as providing better security. And we think that invoking a successful state builder will be associated with an increase in trust towards that entity and may even increase the propensity to report crime to that entity. State builders, though, we think are unlikely to transfer this positive uh, perception to the state. There is an existing literature in the sort of security sector reform, as well as in the particular cases we're studying, including ZISIG, 
that expect that having this outside actor providing this good cert, um, security services should actually augment people's individual perceptions towards the state. Much of this is through this example setting ethos, where we think that essentially having a, a case in which you can see that nobody is above the law in your state, which you thought was completely corrupt, can give you some reassurance that there may be prosecutions that actually could happen here. And you may see some of this capacity transfer in terms of these outside actors working with local actors um, and even cases in which they're punished. Okay, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, and this is the side where we come down on, is that we think that these, uh, the fact that these state builders need to be removed from the political system to be effective may actually signal even more strongly that the state is deficient in terms of like a comparison set that you might otherwise make. So especially as reform takes place, we think that there may actually be a negative effect or at least no effect. So ultimately, we come up with a set of hypotheses about these state institutions. So we expect that having state security institutions involved in a particular case might undermine the gains in perceptions of state building. We think that um, the positive perceptions of state builders will not be associated in an increase in trust in the state institutions or changing the propensity to report crime to the state institutions. And then finally, we think that state builders, especially dependent on whether they're seen as successful, will drive views on which entities are the correct one to investigate and prosecute cases. So this is sort of the broader legitimacy question. The state builder characteristics certainly do have an effect here, right? So I'm sure some of you are thinking of uh, cases where we have um, the UN operating and they're doing um, negative things like uh, taking bribes or um, engaging in prostitution, right? So certainly there are some cases where this is not going to go well, right? But on average, we think that especially in these delegation agreements, which are somewhat specific in that they're a most likely case for transfer, we think that they may work. So first, we think that these IGOs are especially, uh, in these cases, IGOs are especially likely to conduct the mission, so they are removed from the state um, corruption. We think, uh, and we have a little bit of evidence on this, that IGOs only deploy these delegation agreements if they have sufficient resources to do so. Um, and then we think that because these delegation agreements arrive at the request of the host government, they may see some sort of legitimacy just from coming in through a democratic or uh, regular government's process rather than entering through that invasion, for example. And the DA's mandates in these cases are relatively limited. So this forces contact with the domestic counterparts, which we think on average should be good, although this maintains sort of their reputation as well. So, Note these as potential scope conditions, things that may not apply to other cases or findings may not apply to all cases, but these um, at least suggest to us that they may be working in a number of these delegation agreements. Okay, so let me say something very brief about um, CISIG in Guatemala, and then I want to get to the results of our um, uh, analysis. So CISIG, as I mentioned, is this canonical case of a delegation agreement. So in the post-conflict context after 1996, there was an initial version of CISIG that was set up in 2003 and was rejected because it allowed foreign prosecutors to work on their own in the Guatemalan courts. The um, uh, new mandate, which was established in 2006, allows them to do two things. So they can investigate any clandestine structures in the state, and then they can co-prosecute cases with um, the uh, public attorney's office, which we'll be calling the MP uh, based on its Spanish uh, acronym throughout the, the paper. They can also identify corruption in the state and they can recommend individuals to be uh, punished. They can also sort of uh, recommend rule changes, but those are sort of squishier areas in which they work. They don't have the, quite the same like mandate to investigate and prosecute there. Their term did just end in 2019, and I'm happy to talk more about that and what we think that might mean going forward. Okay, so CISIC has been really seemingly successful, especially in the court cases that it has prosecuted, right? So more than 400 people have been convicted out of these 1,500 people who have been investigated by CISIG according to their most recent figures. And they haven't released all of their data yet, but it seems like they have much higher rates of prosecution than these sort of single digits, which were our baseline um, from the Guatemalan case before that. CISIG selects and trains a, a group within the MP's office, which is called FESI, and a small team of the National Civil Police. 
the police relationship is much less known and much less discussed in the media than it is this relationship with the MP and these individuals who are training up to, to prosecute the cases together with them. So overall, it seems to be working in the cases. There's less evidence that the cap capacity transfer has extended beyond sort of these groups that they're directly working with, um, according to a couple of different reports, um, which I have now raised there. All right, so let's think about the research design here and get into the results of the experiment um, that we ran in 2015. All right, so the survey experiment was on perceived effectiveness, trust, crime reporting, and crime response by different security institutions. What we did is we tested um, our hypotheses by embedding an experiment in a face-to-face -face survey, so done uh, by enumerators in person in October of 2015. In total, 1,200 individuals were surveyed. The timing of our survey was the same year as the La Linea case that I mentioned where the president had to step down. So it means that CISIG is more likely to be known and viewed successfully in that year probably than in previous years. But it, um, so it's, it salience increases. This makes our treatment a little bit harder because we're priming on CISIG and people may already be thinking about CISIG anyway. Um, and so then subjects were randomly assigned to one of six treatment groups. They were first primed on which particular investigator was working in a hypothetical case, and then they were primed on what, or they were informed about whether, on average, investigators and prosecutors were successful in Guatemala. So the first part of the experiment looks like this. This is a hypothetical case. It says, I'm going to ask you to consider a hypothetical case during an informing anti-corruption investigation. Two witnesses were found murdered. And then this is what we differ. So investigators, we either just say investigators suspect this, or we say investigators from CISIG success, uh, uh, suspect this, or we say from a collaboration between CISIG and this local MP. Um, suspect that agents had informed the Capos, the head of the drug uh, trafficking organization or gang in the area, um, who is under investigation. Presumably the information these agents provided allowed the criminals to murder these two witnesses. Um, and murders like this are historically ongoing in, in Guatemala. We then, so this is the first manipulation. We then had a manipulation of success after we asked a few of these questions. We said, no hypothetical, case is not far from reality, investigators and prosecutors, and again, we either reminded them of the organization, but we didn't tell them anything about the uh, organization, have been, and then we either said successful or unsuccessful in a number of recent cases against criminal structures. This was not considered by IR, uh, our IRB to be deception, so we were not considered to be lying to these individuals because they had been unsuccessful in a number of cases right up until the La Linea case, which they successfully prosecuted, right? So it kind of could go either way in terms of overall whether you see CISIG is successful or not, and so that's what we're trying to manipulate here to make sure that everyone in our experimental group is sort of on the same page in terms of their views about CISIG. Okay, so the first time they're getting is CISIG and the MP, or not, and then the second one they're getting is whether it's generally seen as successful or unsuccessful. Okay, you can ignore this, this table if you like don't think very much about experiments. What we wanted to get out of this was to think about how many of these people who took the survey actually took our treatment. So did they remember who the investigators were who we had told them about? And we find that on average, there is a statistically significant increase in the number of people who were treated who thought that CISIG was involved in this um, investigation. But the increase is only about 10% um, across these cases, um, either way we measure them. So this is not, we don't think this is far off from other priming experiments, but it's not a huge effect that we're able to change people's views in terms of who they're thinking about. Happy to talk more about this in Q&A if you're interested. Okay. What we then wanted to talk about are four outcomes. So the perceived effectiveness in this hypothetical case of the investigators, and then trust, willingness to report a crime, and general measures of legitimacy um, for CISIG. Okay, so these are the, the three, uh, four sets of results that I'm getting to. So the first case, what we, want, what we found was that CISIG had a distinct positive effect on citizens' perceptions of effectiveness. If we told them that CISIG was going to be involved in the case, they thought that the investigators were much more likely to identify the, pers the um, perpetrators, successfully prosecute and convict them, and punish the police agents who were involved. That's a top rower finding, really positive effect there. 
What we did not find is when they teamed up with their local counterparts, we expected that they might have a negative, that might actually have a negative effect on those um, results, like so people would view them not quite as positively. We do find negative effects on the identifying the per perpetrators and on um, punishing the police agents, but those are very small effects and statistically they're indistinguishable from zero. So we're only finding an effect of having CISIG. If you have CISIG, whether or not they're working with the MP, they're seen as having this positive effect on effectiveness. Okay, so then we wanted to get into sort of the meat of the paper and look at these trust questions. These are general results from trust on trust um, in CISIG and other institutions over time. And what you can see is that CISIG is continuously seen as one of the most trustworthy institutions in the state. These are over time, so 2010, 12, and 17, with CISIG on the left-hand side. And then over here, we have all of the different institutions that were asked about um, in, the, in the 2017 LOPOP survey. And again, you can see CISIG is on the left-hand side in comparison to like political parties who are trusted at very low rates um, in Guatemala and South um, Okay, so CISIG's success does not appear to change trust in the domestic institutions. It does change its effect, like it trusts in CISIG itself. So if we told people that generally CISIG was unsuccessful, we do find less trust in CISIG, the outside <coughs> actor. But what we don't find is whether we tell them it's successful or unsuccessful, that we see very, we see very little effect in trust in the state institutions themselves. And I'm happy to talk, we, we thought a lot about how much power we have in this analysis, and if you're interested in those questions, I'm happy to go into that more in Q&A. Um, the second among these results was that um, we found that a successful CISIG does very little to change crime reporting to any of the security institutions. So we observe very little effect on citizen willingness to report crime to anybody, to CISIG or to the local institutions. They, um, there is sort of this like, idea in the country that CISIG has not been very widespread outside of Guatemala City, so its reach has mainly been in the capital city and not so much in the periphery. So it's maybe not surprising that they would be the least likely to be reported to no matter what. Um, but we find this result, whether we find the analysis just limited to Guatemala City or um, whether we include the whole country um, in our analysis. So, you know, this final point may kind of explain these results, but also we think there's just not much change in, in terms of institution reporting um, going on here. Okay, and then two final results. So, what we asked in this case was whether who should take a leading role in investigating a hypothetical case like the one we had described. Who do you think should take a, a leading role in a, in a case like this? So, on the left-hand side of your screen, these are the number of people who thought that CISIG should take a leading role. And on the right-hand side, you have people who thought that domestic institutions should take the leading role. And what you can see is that when CISIG is seen as unsuccessful, people are less likely to think that it should be the actor who's taking the leading role, right? So we see this decrease among people who are primed with unsuccessful um, CISIG mission um, in taking the leading role. Similarly, when we, well, the flip side, when we see unsuccessful priming on CISIG, we see an increase in the likelihood that people think the domestic um, actors should take the leading role. So this is a possibility that like an unsuccessful outside state builder may somehow leave a little bit of room for a domestic security institution, but we don't see this effect of changing, we don't see anything moving very much with the successful CISIG, right, priming them on success. Except in this final experiment. So the final question that we're asking, our final experimental question. So what we're asking here is who should be granted authority to deal with crime in Guatemala? Um, should it be the local government, the national government, or CISIG? Um, the national government is the one who's mainly tasked with this um, job in Guatemala. And so what we can see here is that when CISIG is viewed or is crime as being successful, we do see a reduction in the likelihood that people will say that the national government should be in charge um, of this function. So this is the one effect that we see as being somewhat negative. The effect is statistically significant. And so we're a little bit concerned about this result because it may be that if you have a successful state builder, you may be seeing kind of this um, reduction in people's um, views of the state as legitimate. Okay, so to, to conclude, 
in this paper, what we're finding is that CISIG's involvement in a hypothetical case increases citizens' perceptions about effectiveness, right? Much more likely to be effective in this particular case. We find that a successful CISIG leads to increased trust in that state, in that external state builder, but it doesn't really seem to move citizens' uh, attitudes towards state institutions in a statistically significant way, except on two dimensions. So an unsuccessful CISIG seems to undermine the outside actor as being uh, the, the, the institution that should take the lead on a particular case and helps the local institutions there. But a successful CISIG seems to undermine perceptions about state institutions in terms of the broad legitimacy of who should be dealing with the crime. So overall, the evidence suggests that um, delegation agreements are perceived as effective, uh, in this case at least, based on this case, but that they have very little effect on the state institutions, except this potentially negative spillover effect on some of these legitimacy outcomes. There are potential scope conditions, as I mentioned, so the type of mission, the actors, the resources may matter, so uh, other cases may not look exactly like Guatemala. Success may also matter once the mission has left. Um, so uh, like this may be a case in which when you're comparing CISIG to another institution, you may see like, oh, well, they're more successful, so we should keep them, or they're less successful, so we shouldn't. But maybe once they've actually left, we may see different results here. Um, but the success seems to be driving some of our results um, in this particular case. So for state builders who are seeking to conduct similar missions in other cases, you know, I mentioned some of these other cases that were um, proposed or carried out in, in Central America and that we see in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the policymakers should be aware of some of these potential limitations. So these missions seem to be successful within their mandates, right, if we're based on the Guatemala case, but that there's sort of li little sign that they're strengthening the state more broadly and they may actually have these pernicious effects on some of these measures of legitimacy in these cases. All right, so I very much welcome your comments and questions on the paper. Um, this is a pretty new paper, and so um, we really look forward to your, to your feedback. Great, thanks very much. Uh, So, just raise your hand and jump in if you have questions or comments. Yes. Are you planning on continuing the research now that CISIC has on Guatemala? Yes. Um, so, we would like to. We need funding to do it. Um, so, we don't have that yet. Um, we think we have a good chance of getting it. What we would like to do is go in and ask about FESI. So, this institution within the public attorney's office, public prosecutor's office, that had been working with CISIC. We would like to sort of give people different information about how much they had cooperated with CISIG in the past and see whether people had some sort of residual trust for this now domestic institution that got some learning transfer and, and capacity transfer during the, the mission. Um, so we would like to do an experiment like that. We would actually like to do a field experiment and ask people whether they would be willing to report crimes um, and whether they want to click through because FESI actually has a website where they where people can go and report crimes. Um, so what we're hoping to do is actually be able to give people different types of information about FESI and then see who clicks through and who potentially reports crimes based on that information. Um, so that's a follow-up we would like to do because we would really like to see whether these effects